D'accord Welcome. My name is Karen Schubert, and I'm here with Ashley Dillon from Lit Youngstown, a literary arts center in Northeast Ohio in the U.S. I welcome you to this reading co-hosted by Action Books, World Poetry Books, and Elizabeth's Bookshop and Writing Center, and sponsored by Gabriel Palmer Fernandez and Sarah Lown. And thank you all for being here. While you are with us, we encourage you to donate to organizations who are supporting people caught in the crisis in Gaza, Médecins Sans Frontières and World Central Kitchen. Many thanks to Carrie George and Elizabeth's Bookshop for making a bookshelf on bookshop.org where you can browse to purchase books by today's poets and translators. For today's event, we will begin with brief readings by our four poets, followed by a brief conversation on translation with our three translators, followed by a brief conversation with our presses and booksellers. And I'm saying brief, brief, brief to let you know that we are mindful of your attention online. And I wish I were inviting you all into a welcoming space in my home with tea, and all afternoon to reflect deeply on the work we are called to do. Our first reader is Gayat Almadun, who will read in his native Arabic with translation by Catherine Cobham. Gayat Almadun is a Palestinian poet born in Damascus, Syria, who emigrated to Sweden and lives between Berlin and Stockholm. He has published four poetry collections in Arabic and has been translated into over 20 languages. Amadun has collaborated with other poets and artists, and his poetry has been part of work by U.S. artist Jenny Holzer, German musician Blixa Bargeld, and others. His latest collection, Adrenaline, was published by in, in English by Action Books. Catherine Cobham taught Arabic language and literature at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland for many years and has translated the work of a number of Arab writers, including poetry by Mahmoud Darwish, and fiction by Yusuf Idris, Nagib Mahfouz, Hanan al Sheikh and Fuad Al-Takari. Al Welcome, Gayath and Catherine. Thank you, Karen. And I would like to thank first uh, you all for the, giving me the chance to read. And I would like to thank Catherine for the translation. Uh, Catherine, she translated this book uh, a couple of years ago. It's appeared in 2017 by Action Books. So I will read from the three poems I will read. It will be from uh, the book Adrenaline, and I will read the text first in Arabic, and Catherine will read the English. Nahnu. Nahnu al mutanathirina shadaya, al mumtirina lahman. نتقدم بالاعتذار الشديد من هذا العالم المتحضر فردا فردا رجالا ونساء وأطفالا لأننا وبدون قصد منا ظهرنا في منازلهم الآمنة بلا استئذان نعتذر لانطباع أشلائنا في ذاكرتهم البيضاء كالثلج ولأننا خدشنا صورة الإنسان الطبيعي الكامل في أعينهم لأننا وبكل وقاحة قفزنا فجأة على نشرات الأخبار وصفحات الإنترنت والجرائد عاريين إلا من دمائنا وبقايا أجسادنا المتفحمة نعتذر من كل العيون التي لم تجرؤ أن تنظر في جراحنا مباشرة لكي لا تصاب بالقشعريرة ونعتذر من كل من لم يستطع إكمال وجبة العشاء بعد أن فاجأته صورنا طازجة على التلفزيون نعتذر عن الآلام التي سببناها لكل من رآنا هكذا بلا تجميل أو تقطيب أو إعادة جمع لبقايانا وقطعنا قبل أن نظهر في الشاشات ونعتذر أيضا من الجنود الإسرائيليين الذين تكلفوا 
عناء الضغط على الأزرار في طائراتهم ودباباتهم لتحويلنا إلى قطع نعتذر منهم عن الصور البشعة التي تحولنا إليها بعد أن صوبوا قنابلهم مباشرة إلى رؤوسنا الطرية وعلى الساعات التي سيقضونها الآن في عيادات الأطباء النفسيين ليعودوا بشرا كما كانوا قبل تحويلنا إلى أشلاء مقززة تلاحقهم كل ما حاولوا النوم نحن الأشياء التي رأيتموها على الشاشات والصحف والتي إن اجتهدتم في جمع بقاياها كلعبة البذل فإنكم ستفوزون بصورة واضحة لنا واضحة لدرجتي أنكم لن تستطيعوا أن تفعلوا شيئا أنا سأقول This is we, Shkida, we. We who are strewn about in fragments, whose flesh flies through the air like raindrops, offer our profound apologies to everyone in this civilized world, men, women, and children, because we have unintentionally appeared in their peaceful homes without asking permission. We apologize for stamping our severed body parts into their snow white memory, because we have violated the image of the normal whole human being in their eyes because we have had the impertinence to leap suddenly onto news bulletins and the pages of the internet and the press, naked except for our blood and charred remains. We apologize to all those who didn't have the courage to look directly at our injuries for fear they would be too horrified, and to those unable to finish their evening meals after they had unexpectedly seen fresh images of us on television. We apologize for the suffering we caused to all who saw us like that, unembellished, with no attempt having been made to put us back together or reassemble our remains before we appeared on their screens. We also apologize to the Israeli soldiers who took, excuse me, who took the trouble to press the buttons in their aircraft and in their tanks to blow us to pieces. And we are sorry for how hideous we looked after they aimed their shells and bombs straight at our soft heads and for the hours they are now going to spend in, psychiatri in psychiatrists' clinics, trying to become human again, like they were before our transformation into repulsive body parts that pursue them whenever they try to sleep. We are the things you have seen on your screens and in the press, and if you made an effort to fit the pieces together like a jigsaw, you would get a clear picture of us, so clear that you would be unable to do a thing. Thank you, Catherine. That poem I wrote uh, during uh, Gaza attack, were attacked by Israel in the end of 2008, meaning in 2000, 2009, mm. and there were at that time 1,400 people, civilians mm. got killed. 900 of them were women and children. And that was like a very small number compared with now. It's like 20 times more now. Mm -hmm. But as if it's written for now. كيف أصبحت؟ سقط حزنها من الشرفة وانكسر أصبحت تحتاز إلى حزن جديد حين رافقتها إلى السوق كانت أسعار الأحزان خيالية فنصحتها أن تشتري حزنا مستعملا وجدنا حزنا في حالة جيدة غير أنه واسع قليلا كان كما أخبرنا البائع لشاعر شاب انتحر في الصيف الماضي أعجبها الحزن وقررنا أخذه اختلفنا مع البائع على السعر فقال إنه سيعطينا قلقا يعود إلى الستينيات كهدية مجانية إن اشترينا الحزن وافقنا وكنت فرحا بهذا القلق الذي لم يكن في الحسبان أحست بفرحتي فقالت هو لك أخذت القلق في حقيبتي ومضينا مساء تذكرت القلق أخرجته من الحقيبة وقلبته لقد كان بجودة عالية وبحالة جيدة رغم نصف قرن من الاستعمال لابد أن البائع يجهل قيمته وإلا ما كان ليعطيناه مقابل شراء حزن رديء لشاعر شاب أكثر ما أفرحني به هو أنه قلق وجودي مشغول بحرفية عالية وفيه تفاصيل غاية في الدقة والجمال لابد أنه يعود لمثقف موسوعي أو سجين سابق بدأت باستعماله فأصبح الأرق رفيق أيامي وصرت من مؤيدي مباحثات السلام توقفت عن زيارة الأقارب وازدادت كتب المذكرات في مكتبتي 
ولم أعد أبدي رأيا إلا ما ندر صار الإنسان عندي أغلى من الوطن وبدأت أشعر بملل عام أما أكثر ما لفت انتباهي هو أنني أصبحت شاعر So this is how I became. Her grief fell from the balcony and broke into pieces, so she needed a new grief. When I went with her to the market, the prices were unreal, so I advised her to buy a used grief. We found one in excellent condition, although it was a bit big. As the vendor told us, it belonged to a young poet who had killed himself the previous summer. She liked this grief, so we decided to take it. We argued with the vendor over the price and uh, he said he'd give us an angst dating from the 60s as a free gift if we bought this grief. We agreed and I was happy with the unexpected angst. She sensed this and said it's yours. I took it and put it in my bag and we went off. In the evening I remembered it and took it out of the bag and examined it closely. It was high quality and in excellent condition, despite half a century of use. The vendor must have been unaware of its value, otherwise he wouldn't have given it to us in exchange for buying a young poet's low quality grief. The thing that pleased me most about it was that it was existentialist angst, meticulously crafted and containing details of extraordinary subtlety and uh, beauty. It must have belonged to an intellectual with an encyclopedic knowledge or a former prisoner. I began to use it and insomnia became my constant companion. I became an enthusiastic supporter of peace negotiations and stopped visiting relatives. There were increasing numbers of memoirs in my bookshelves and I no longer voiced my opinion except on rare occasions. Human beings became more precious to me than nations and I began to feel a general ennui. But what I noticed most was that I had become a poet المجزرة المجزرة مجاز ميت يأكل أصدقائي يأكلهم بلا ملح كانوا شعراء وأصبحوا مراسلين مع حدود كانوا متعبين وأصبحوا متعبين جدا يعبرون الجسر في الصبح خفافا ويموتون خارج التغطية إنني أراهم بالمناظير الليلية وأتتبع حرارة أجسادهم في الظلام ها هم يهربون منها إليها مستسلمين لهذا المساج الهائل المجزرة أمهم الحقيقية أما الإبادة الجماعية فهي مجرد قصيدة كلاسيكية يكتبها جنرالات مثقفون أحيل إلى التقاعد الإبادة الجماعية لا تليق بأصدقائي فهي عمل جماعي منظم والأعمال الجماعية المنظمة تذكرهم باليسار الذي خذلهم المجزرة تصحو باكرا تحمم أصدقائي بالماء البارد والدم ترسل ملابسهم الداخلية وتعد لهم الخبز والشاي ثم تعلمهم قليلا من الصيد المجزرة أحن على أصدقائي من الإعلان العالمي لحقوق الإنسان فتحت لهم الباب حين غلقت الأبواب ونادتهم بأسمائهم حين كانت نشرات الأخبار تبحث عن عدد الضحايا المجزرة هي الوحيدة التي منحتهم اللجوء بغض النظر عن خلفياتهم لم يهمها وضعهم الاقتصادي لم يهمها إن كانوا مثقفين أو شعراء إنها تنظر إلى الأشياء من زاوية محايدة لها ملامحهم الميتة نفسها وأسماء زوجاتهم الأرامل تمر مثلهم على الأرياف والضواحي وتظهر فجأة مثلهم في الأخبار العاجلة المجزرة تشبه أصدقائي لكنها دائما تسبقهم إلى القرى النائية ومدارس الأطفال المجزرة مجاز ميت يخرج من التلفزيون ويأكل أصدقائي دون رشة ملح واحدة طيب This is Massacre Massacre is a dead metaphor that is eating my friend eating them without salt they were poets and have become reporters with borders. They were already tired and now they're even more tired. They crossed the bridge at daybreak, fleet of foot, 
as the poet wrote, and they die with no phone coverage. I see them through night vision goggles and follow the heat of their bodies in the darkness. There they are, fleeing from it, even as they run towards it, surrendering to this huge massage. Massacre is their true mother, while genocide is no more than a classical poem written by intellectual pensioned off generals. Genocide isn't appropriate for my friends as it's an organized collective action and organized collective actions remind them of the left that let them down. Massacre wakes up early, bathes my friends in cold water and blood, washes their underclothes and makes them bread and tea, then teaches them a little about the hunt. Massacre is more compassionate to my friends than the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Massacre opened the door to them when other doors were closed and called them by their names when news reports, when news reports were looking for numbers. Massacre is the only one to grant them asylum, regardless of their backgrounds. Their economic circumstances don't bother Massacre, nor does Massacre care whether they are intellectuals or poets. Massacre looks at things from a neutral angle. Massacre has the same dead features as them, the same names as their widowed wives, passes like them through the countryside and the suburbs, and appears suddenly like them in breaking news. Massacre resembles my friends but always arrives before them in faraway villages and children's schools. Massacre is a dead metaphor that comes out of the television and eats my friends without a single pinch of salt. Um, this, this one line that in the poem, they cross the bridge at daybreak fleet of foot is a quote from a poem by a Lebanese poet, uh, Khalil Hawi. Um, I wondered if... Rayath would like to mention him, it was Khalil Khawi. Yeah, Khalil Khawi is a wonderful poet, he's a Christian poet, and he couldn't handle when he saw Ariel Sharon entering Beirut. So he shot himself by a gun. It was a very, very heavy moment to see a city like Beirut destroyed by Israel, so he killed himself immediately. Yeah. So that's just a, that, what that so line. Thank you, hmm. Catherine, for the reading the translation. Thank you, Karen. Yes, thank you for the poems. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank I'm you sorry. so much, Gayath and Catherine. Palestinian American poet, writer, and editor Dima K. Shahabi is author of 13 Departures from the Moon and co editor with Bo Bosule of Al Mutanabi Street Starts Here. She's also co-author of Diaspo Renga with Marilyn Hacker and winner of the Nazim Hikmet Poetry Competition in 2018. Welcome, Dima. Sorry, thank you. Um, thank you to Phil Mitridis and Karen Schubert for organizing this really important event. I just want to take a moment to address your audience and say, please take moments in your day to center the Palestinian genocide and engage in some kind of activism, whether it's contacting your congressperson, attending a protest, or, and this is really important, getting in the way of any false narratives. So I urge people to do that as much as possible. I'd like to begin with an ode to my Gazan uncle, and this poem is entitled Nahid. Nahid. The Mu'adhan gripped the minaret's head and dipped it into the sea. Water in the submerged prayer's voice rushed ahead. A voice like water reached the cemetery deep within the city. They didn't believe he crushed a girl's ribs with just one hug. They didn't believe he crushed her ribs in an orchard full of pines. She forbade the children to shout his name across the house walls. Instead, whisper it to the grapevine where salt in its veins will mix with tears cried over him and strangle the gardener's nose. He pricked her with a poem for his dead mother, then composed a wedding song for the newlyweds and stitched it across the sky between the moon balcony and pink jasmine, between Jerusalem and Gaza, between the olive and lemon. 
I want to break this house with sobs, he said, each sob for a lost sister, each sister a blossom from the vine of Lady Banks Rose. Heat from the sea's sun condensed the sweat on his forehead, which fell into a poppy that grew out of a rock as seen by a tourist from Norway. Her head on his chest next to a bubbling fountain on a Sunday in a garden in Damascus. His voice muffled the faint cries of the tortured in the wind. Faith can't be measured by how far an eye can see, he said to her once as she wiped mascara from her eyelids. She said to his son as he walked along the pier, I was selling sardines at the fish market with my 10 children and he gave me a box full of lemons, oranges and grapefruits from a heavenly orchard. How could you allow a womb full of adjectives to break off from my body, she whispered as they swung low on a hammock in autumn. This next poem um, explores is an exploration of temporality and belonging. It's called Vista. What goes extinct while grazing on memory's lawn in the sun? When you said, I'd cut my tongue, I grew a callus over your mouth. Once I tiptoed to catch a glimpse of you, though I was not yours. But there was recognition through the window, my eyes knocking on cleansed glass as I closed further into sleep, into preludes away from you. Why am I speaking at all when what's unsaid between us is a rosette of moth wings beating in the sky's eardrum? I don't flock to passions when I seek you. If all was taken, who would you be? Still, I know what I sensed as I watched you swim out from under the bridge trying to sip the Pacific. If it wasn't for the undercurrent, I'd have let you go further, but the hour was a cool blue cluttered with your lips. There's a story you know, it begins with your right hand over mine as I practice my handwriting. I lay my elephs here like ripe fruit, like a home away. Now, this next poem is um, a series of sonnets. It's called the Sun Theater Sonnets. Um, and it starts with a, it's response sort of to a epitaph by Agha Shahid Ali, who says, for whose world is not in ruins, whose? You wrote me from a bed where you'd see the mountain's alders corral the sky. Who'll empty my last pocket when I'm gone? Once sitting with you on a fountain's edge, I unpinned the debris in my pocket into the basin where you had unfingered rose petals, their outline fading into our bleating desires, the still. When you passed, they transferred a ring from your small hand to mine, and I rested my lips in your mouth's smallest pocket. Oh, mother, I tore your letter and hurled my body to the sun-long corridor. Your skin was desolation. Come, hovering angel. Come, hovering angel. Desolation leaves me gray, chain smoking by a quaking aspen tree who moans a throaty sea song when the wind bristles through its taut ribcage. I'm your daughter, holding a place panting on a roadway where you leave me no sun to pass through. In a morning dream, I dwarf you, removing a seashore from your face. Then your lips move and you wave your hand. God almighty, you say, your eyes sewn tightly, though you drag your thick desert voice over zoysia grass, exhuming miniature yellow butterflies and displacing them to a thicket of dusk after the wet. To a thicket of dusk after the wet you pray. Don't, don't let me leave this earth broken willed, O coiler of sorrows, O lost root. 
Eyes like forest trees, you breathe it in whole, while the mountain pelts you with clouds, semen-scented chestnut tree blossoms, edelweiss. Thirty years before, you trailed a messy sun to your father's small tomb in Gaza, salt in your nostrils as the lemon light bound your eyes to the orchard's gray marrow. Decades later, your daughter averts her gaze from the limb mine soil, while her lover says, breathe. The soil coos and rallies her waters, for whose unlucky dead are at peace? Whose? For whose unlucky dead are at peace? Whose? Quarantina. Every seaside city juts a neighborhood where it's illegal sell jujube in the streets. Love disguises itself to feed you apricots, mangoes. Afternoons, pigeons thicketed the sun while we ambled underneath rusty green shutters. Do you remember how easily we held hands? How the sky was full of twigs when our skin touched? To open this hour is all, you'd say. At the corner store, we hemmed our skirts, drawing heels for long embroidered dresses. The seamstress swears she saw you as you were, a field misting the pond, a bent country. Thanks. Thank you, Tima. Born in Haifa in 1944, Olivia Elias has lived on three continents and she writes in French, translated into English, Arabic, Brazilian, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, and Japanese. Her poetry has appeared in numerous reviews and anthologies. She re recently published two po poetical collections, Chaos Crossing, translated by Karim James Abu Zaid, and Your Name, Palestine, published by World Poetry Books. Sarah Riggs is a poet based in New York. Her eighth book, Lines, coming out with winter editions in 2025. She translates poetry from the French, including Etel Adnan, Soad La Bise, and has co-edited with Omar Berada, Another Room to Live In, 15 Contemporary Arab Poets, coming out with Litmus Press, from the Tamas Poetry Tens Translation Seminars. Jeremy Victor Robert is a translator who works and lives in his native Réunion um, in Africa. Together with Sarah Riggs, he translated Olivia Elise's Your Name, Palestine into English. He published French translations of Donna Stone Cipher's Model City, and Etel Adnan's Sea and Fog. Welcome, Olivia, Sarah, and Jeremy. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for hosting, uh, for your uh, editing house to toast to this event. Yes, I will uh, say, I uh, like Dima. Please, um, yes, yeah, support Palestinian uh, literature. Uh, you, you could find uh, a lot of information on uh, the website and the uh, X of uh, Arab Lit, because you have this group of publishers for Palestine who offered the, their ebooks free. And uh, there is a Freedom Theater in, uh, in Jenin, which did a lot of for, to on the cultural feed in um, in West Bank, and uh, they say that today this is a time of the culture. Culture, culture is very important for Palestine. But we don't have arms. We don't. We have no power. We have words, and they want to silence our words. So please uh, uh, read and let uh, the uh, Palestinian literature and uh, artists uh, known. Thank you. So I will read first of Chaos Crossing, which was uh, published in November 2022 by World Poetry. And I am very pleased that uh, the editor, Matvei Yankelevich, is there, is attending uh, 
with is with uh, us. So I st I will start for the first with the first poem of the book, which is called Migration des étoiles. Dans ce pays, les étoiles n'étaient pas stabilisées. Elles pouvaient tout aussi bien s'envoler d'un seul coup, migrer vers des contrées où le bonheur est moins précaire. Et c'est ce qui arriva. En fait, il en était ainsi de tout. La vie même pouvait s'envoler. L'eau s'arrêtait de couler. La maison et le champ s'évanouirent. Comme ça, piste, à leur place, un mur bouche l'horizon. Une maison de béton surgissait bientôt, suivie de milliers d'autres, toutes semblables. Habitées au près, était comme campé au bord d'un volcan prêt à exploser. La nuit, les laves jaillissaient, les loups rodés babines retroussées. Les femmes avaient beau lancer des cailloux, faire des nœuds à leurs mouchoirs, accrocher des perles bleues ou de petites croix au cou des enfants, il y en avait tous les jours davantage. Savez-vous le bruit que fait un olivier qui s'écroule racine à l'air et celui d'une balle frappant un homme en plein front Migration of stars In this country, the stars were not fixed. They could easily fly off in a single go, migrate to regions where happiness is less precarious. And that's precisely what happened. In fact, it was that way with everything. Life itself could fly off. The water stopped flowing, the house and field vanish, just like that, in their place, a wall blocking the horizon. A concrete house sprang up, followed soon by thousands of others, all the same. Living nearby was like camping on the edge of a volcano ready to blow. At night, the lava gushed out, the wolves prowled with their teeth bared. The women threw stones, tied knots in their handkerchiefs, hung blue beads and small crosses around the children's necks. There were more of them every day. Do you know the sound of an olive tree being uprooted or of a bullet striking a man right between the eyes? So now a second poem from uh, Chaos Crossing. This poem was, has been written one year after the big marches for claiming for the right of return at the border between Gaza and uh, Israel, and you know, uh, they were pacific, uh, peaceful marches, and uh, the soldiers like um, uh, hit with the real, uh, real uh, munitions, and they were like in uh, uh, the marches uh, lasted for uh, about one year, and in the six first months, there were ten thousand young people who were wounded and. Uh, uh, usually they were hitting at uh, at the knees, so so there was a, a lot of people uh, who could uh, have, who has to be uh, you know amputated. Sin distinctif. Corps de femme sous drap noir. Peuple sous drap noir. Trou pour regard. Au vu et au su. Tombe, jeunesse scalpée. Cet été-là, nous devînmes experts en construction de béquilles. Partout sautillent les hommes héros. Avec des béquilles, pourrais-je enjamber la mer ou si au démonté me réfugier dans l'arche de Noé Construire un phare pour éclairer l'horizon Monter à l'assaut de la tour de Babel creuser un tunnel 
et surgir par une nuit de lune noire sur le mont des Oliviers ou l'esplanade des mosquées. Là m'attendra un cheval invincible qui m'emportera loin, très loin. Chevauchant nos coursiers blancs, nous jouerons au polo avec les étoiles, au vainqueur la lune. En d'autres temps, sous d'autres cieux, pour un larcin de rien, du pain, oreille coupée, une seconde. François Villon, ta petite maman, elle est fichue, bien serrée, sous le menton même à la saison des cerises rouges. Aujourd'hui, dans ce ghetto de Méditerranée, partout sautillent les hommes et roux. Moi, n'ai rien pris à personne et ne réclame que ma maison, mon olivier et mon champ. Au bas du dos tatoué, le signe distinctif, une béquille de ceux condamnés à perdre corps et vie par droit absolu de conquête. Pourtant, petite, j'aimais les guirlandes et les robes de princesse. Elles dorment aujourd'hui dans la valise des rêves. Des contes de mon enfance, seuls les ogres, les ogres se sont réincarnés. Occupés ailleurs, les fées veillent sur d'autres berceaux. Immense le champignon atomique dans le ciel de Méditerranée. Distinctive Mark Women's bodies under black sheets, entire peoples under ba black sheets, slits to see through. In full view, they fall, a scalped youth. That summer, we became experts in the construction of crutches. Everywhere hopped the heron men. Could I, with crutches, step over the sea or in choppy waters take refuge in the ark? build a lighthouse to light up the horizon, storm the Tower of Babel, dig a, a tunnel and come through a black moon night onto the Mount of Olives or the Temple Mount. An invisible horse will be waiting there to take me away, far away. Riding our white steeds will play polo with the stars. To the victor, the moon. In other times, under other skies for a petty theft or nothing of bread, ear cut off, just a second. François Villon, your mommy was heading to the season of red cherries, scarf tied tight beneath her chin. Today, in this Mediterranean ghetto, the heron men are hopping everywhere. Me, I've taken nothing from anyone and asked for nothing but my house, my olive tree, my field. On the lower part of the tattooed back, the distinctive mark, a crutch of those condemned to lose body and life by absolute right of conquest. Yet, as a child, I loved garlands and the gowns of princesses. Today, they're sleeping in a suitcase of dreams. From the tales of my childhood, Only the ogres have been reborn. The fairies busy elsewhere watch over other cradles. Massive, this mushroom cloud in the Mediterranean sky. Now I will read from the second book that World Poetry published in, um, in September 2023. Here it is. Your name, Palestine. And it's really Matvei Yankelevich, the editor who, de who decided to publish it. And it's very astonishing because it's really like a, if it, it speaks of the situation today. I, and I, it was, uh, I wrote it in 2016. And it was inspired by Aimé Césaire, Notebook for a Return to the Native Land. It's a, wond it's a wonderful uh, little book that uh, André Breton, uh, when he read this book, it makes a career of Amy Césaire after that. He was a very young man and he was, after his formative years in Paris, he was returning to his native land. So in French first. There is a first part is a 13 sections. 
it's for two people and with music. So we will read the first section and the last se section. Je suis née au pays de la beauté, la beauté devant, la beauté derrière, la beauté tout autour. Couché dans le berceau, j'ai plongé mes yeux dans ton bleu si parfait que je m'y suis noyé à jamais. Dans la lumière primordiale, chaque chose advient à l'instant même, avec à ses côtés son ombre profilée. Arbre, oiseau, fleur, enfant, jeune fille. Toujours. Les jeux de la lumière et du vent, entre mer et ciel, collines et déserts, dans les effluves d'amandier et de jasmin. Par quel miracle s'ordonne cette musique rouge, bleue et or, ponctuée de notes argentées et de la flamme noire des cyprès Une musique qui donne à entendre la voix des hommes, le frisson d'émotion enveloppant toute chose. J'ai longtemps cherché les mots pour dire ta beauté. J'y ai renoncé. Plus poète que des poètes, les peintres m'ont montré le chemin. Pour cerner ton mystère, il faut s'y plonger tout entier. Goûter tes fruits gorgés de sève. Laisser tes fontaines couler dans nos veines. Faire cette expérience unique d'être à ton image éternelle. Et nouveau-né, ta beauté ardente aux Palestine chemine à nos côtés sur les chemins de l'exil, avec dans nos baluchons un peu de cette terre rouge, talisman sur le tel des disparus. Your name, Palestine. I was born in the land of beauty. Beauty before, beauty behind, beauty all around. Lying in my crib, I dove my eyes into your blue, so perfect that I drowned in it forever. In the primordial light, everything appears at the same time, an outline shadow by its side. Tree, bird, flower, child, young girl, Always the light and the wind playing between sea and sky hills and deserts, smelling of almond and jasmine in bloom. Which miracle ordains this red, blue and gold music punctuated with notes of silver and the black flame of Cyprus? A music that echoes the voices of men, the shiver of emotion, enveloping everything. I have long looked for the words to describe your beauty, but I have given up. Better poets than the poets, painters have shown me the way to grasp your mystery. We must dive head first, taste your juicy fruits, let your fountains run in our veins, live this unique experience of being in your image eternal, and newly born. Your blazing beauty, O Palestine, walks on our sides, on the roads of exile, while we carry in our bundles a bit of this red earth, talisman, on the altar of the disappeared. For the last section, Palestine, à l'appel de ton nom, les foules se lèvent, chantant ton odyssée. Engloutie, tu deviens éternelle, interdite. Ta voix résonne plus fort encore. Et plus tu subis, et plus nous croyons en la victoire. Je dis que le triomphe de l'amour est l'espoir. Je dis ton nom de Palestine comme le mantra suprême de la libération. Et je prends mon envol du fond de ma prison. Musicien, entendez-vous la vibration se propager sur tous les continents Palestine, tu tombes et te relèves, 
et avec toi s'avance, serré sous ton manteau de champs d'oliviers et de collines, criblé de balles et traînant dans la poussière la grande humanité, celle qui se lève au petit matin, fait des milliers de kilomètres sur des routes improbables, rêvant d'un avenir meilleur. Césaire, tu l'as dit, il y a place pour tous au rendez-vous de la conquête. Une nouvelle bonté croît à l'horizon et danse le soleil au-dessus de nos têtes. Thank you. Palestine, when they hear your name, crowds rise and sing your odyssey. Engulfed, you become eternal. Forbidden, your voice resonates stronger still. And the more you suffer, the more we believe in your victory. I say that the triumph of love is hope. I say your name, Palestine, like the supreme mantra of liberation. And I take flight from the depth of my prison. Musicians, can you hear this vibration spreading on every continent? Palestine, you fall and rise and huddled beneath your coat of olive groves and hills, riddled with bullets and trailing in the dust. Humanity in all its great greatness moves forward. The one that wakes up at daybreak walks thousands of miles on improbable roads and dreams of a better future. Césaire said it, there is room for everyone at the rendezvous of victory. A new kindness grows on the horizon and let the sun dance above our heads. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, Jeremy, and Sarah. Philip Metris has written 12 books, including Fugitive, Refuge, Shrapnel Maps, and Sand Opera, winner of Guggenheim and Lannan Fellowships, and three Arab American Book Awards. He is professor, professor of English and director of the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Program at John Carroll University. He believes in a free Palestine. Welcome, Philip. Thank you so much, Karen, and thanks to all the my fellow poets and translators and writers here. I'm just terribly moved by this, um, that we can gather in this virtual space across continents and time to to celebrate the, the work um, and the voices of Palestinian writers. Um, I'm just recalling that my first public reading ever was over 25 years ago, and it was in fact a reading of Palestinian poems and translation back at Indiana University when I was a graduate student. And so poetry and Palestine have been deeply entangled for me in so many different ways. I'd like to begin with a, a poem from Fugitive Refuge that is dealing with uh, my own lament about sometimes my inability to speak strongly and speak out. Um, it is. It, it was written for Mossab Abu Toha, who I'm sure many of you know as the poet in Gaza who um, was recently uh, detained, interrogated, tortured, and um, also the poet of a, a, a fantastic book. Um, so this is a poem for him. It's called Remorse for Temperate Speech. And the title is a play on uh, the title by W.B. Yeats of Remorse for Intemperate Speech. But in this case, I want to find um, my outrage the voice of my outrage, which is sometimes been hidden by myself, been suppressed by myself. Remorse for temperate speech. For I spoke as if I knew to you who know how a clout house looks clothed in flames from the inside, you sitting in the smoke, as if watching my prose only stoke the flames in that stagnant room among stagnant rooms with a powerful talk for your people, bound in the margins of empire's book who speak and speak and speak and pretend to listen. 
May you find the wadi where water flows into future and greet what has come before, where you did not know you knew before, the unmapped hidden wadi where past and future meets. I'm sorry, I'm just noticing that in the galley proof, the Arabic is flipped. <laughs> It's driving me bananas, but uh, it's fixed in the book. So in any case, <laughs> you know, I'm sure everyone who's worked with Arabic knows exactly that phenomenon, how um, often in, when people translate translate and convert, which we'll probably talk about in the translation portion of this. Um, so that's from Fugitive Refuge, just for Mosab Abu Toha. Um, I'd like to read two or three poems by Palestinian poets in translation, the first of which is from this wonderful little Ibis Editions collection called Sadder Than Water by Samah al Qasim. Uh, this is translated by um, Nazih Kassis. And this is a, Ibis Editions is this little press that Peter Cole started in Jerusalem actually. And he, they published um, Kirbet Hiza and many other really radical and powerful books, both Palestinian and Israeli. Um, so I, I would just want to just take a quick shout out to say one of the things that's given me so much uh, hope and 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 light in this time is the courageous uh, actions, of course, of Palestinians and Palestinians Amer and Americans, but also the Jewish Voice for Peace, and they're they're standing up in articulating their Jewish identity as uh, an identity of liberation and of solidarity with um, with Palestinian longs, longing for freedom. Um, this is called End of a Talk with the Jailer. From the narrow window of my small cell, I see trees that are smiling at me and rooftops crowded with my family and windows weeping and praying for me. From the narrow window of my small cell, I can see you're a big cell. And this is from uh, You Can Be the Last Leaf Selected Poems by Maya Abu Al Hayat, translated by Fadi Judah. This is called Daily I Imagine Them. Those who die in wars that don't concern them, they were driving through shortcuts or smoking their cigarettes on the roof, watching a romantic comedy or a cooking show. They were passing through the wrong war to become numbers and martyrs. I imagine their sorrow as I cross a checkpoint, wait for my kids after school, peel garlic and smell my fingers, or peek out the window to shoo pigeons away. And at night in bed, I dream of a war that's got no war in it. This is published by Milkweed. I don't know if people are familiar with this book, but this was uh, one of the Bibles, the tomes that uh, Salma Jayusi uh, put together many years ago, look, it's, it's quite faded now, the anthology of modern Palestinian literature. This is going back 30 years. This was kind of uh, my, my first education in Palestinian literature. I wanted to read one poem from here, if I can find it. Um, I had it, but look how many poems that I've marked for future reading. <laughs> it's by Fadwa Tukan. See, where are you? Fadwa, there you are. You can see. This is called The Deluge and the Tree. This is after the 1967 war. It said, uh, after, you know, the, the epigraph here is after the 1967 war, the June war, the Six Day War, all the, all the names for the, this war. Foreign papers slanted news in a way that gloated over mis the misfortune as if the end of the Arab people had been decided by this relapse. And this is when this poem was born. It's called The Deluge and the Tree. When the hurricane swirled and spread its deluge of dark evil onto the good green land, they gloated. The western skies reverberated with joyous accounts. The tree has fallen. 
The great trunk is smashed. The hurricane leaves no life in the tree. Had the tree really fallen? Not with our red streams flowing forever, not while the wine of our torn limbs feed the thirsty roots, Arab roots alive, tunneling deep, deep into the land. When the tree rises up, the branches shall flourish, fresh in the sun, the laughter of the tree shall leaf beneath the sun, and birds shall return. Undoubtedly, the birds shall return. The birds shall return. I think I have time for two little poems from Shrapnel Maps. Um, and I'll finish up. So this is a poem called Zaytun, the olive tree. Where are you, Zaytun? You're hiding from me. How can the Zaytun hide that they're so majestically gnarled they can't hide here you are all right consider the olive it gnarls as it grows into itself a veritable thicket thicket it throws up obstacles to the light to reach the light a crooked path in the air while beneath our sight it wrestles the rock rests water from whatever trickles beneath it doesn't worry, it looks like hell, refuses to straighten for anyone. Each spring offers itself meat to be eaten, first brambles, then olives. Last little poem here. So I hope that we can all find our voices, um, our Congress people, for those of us who are Americans need to hear from us. Um, this is our this is our time to speak up for those who can't speak for us. Uh, I think if the U.S. Um, put its voice in this and stopped for one second military aid, things would be different. We're directly feeding this war machine because there is word there is a word for love in this tongue that entwines two people as one and there is a word for love in this tongue that nests in the chambers of the heart and a word for love in this tongue in which you lose yourself in this tongue and a word that carries sorrow within its vowels and a word for love that exudes from your pores and a word for love that shares its name with falling thank you Thank you, fellow. Thank you all for sharing your fine work. Now I'd like to turn to the translators. Catherine, I'd like to begin with you. Translator Angela Rodal says that she fell for translation when she realized she loved exploring the inner workings of language, comparing and contrasting constructions. Will you please briefly talk about the pleasure and challenges of translating from Arabic into English? Gosh, yeah, I should have prepared myself for this question. Can you hear me? My mute's off. Yeah, OK. Um, the funny thing was that I studied English literature and I only studied um, Arabic uh, a few years after the June War because I really heard such funny things about Arabs and people had stereotypes about Arabs and I wanted to know what they wrote about and what their literature was like. So, you know, at this young age, I thought I'll translate Arabic fiction and Hebrew fiction and the whole world will change and be a lovely place. I never never learned Hebrew, but I was obviously very disingenuous about the whole thing. But um, so, so it's only recently that I've got into translating poetry, really. And I find that very fascinating because of what, you know, what you said about syntax and I can't remember what you said, but I mean, the syntax and the images are much more concentrated and focused. And I really enjoy that in a way much more than translating fiction, although I think more people read fiction, so you get more of an audience. But um, so <laughs> ask me another. That's perfect. 
<laughs> Thank you. Jeremy, will you please talk briefly about how you and Sarah worked together to translate Olivia's book, Your Name, Palestine? Well, yeah, thank you. Um, the exciting part was like, you know, for Sarah, in, French was is not her first language and English is not my first language. So we would have to meet halfway, you know, and to work on the subtleties around the poems because the poems, as Olivia said earlier, the poem is built as a song, you know, with musicians. And you have to find this right voice, this right third voice, you know, the mixture of our two voices combined. And that's what what was, you know, the most exciting about this collaboration, I would say. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks. Sarah, would you like to touch on the importance of translation specifically for a US audience and the landscape and availability of translation in the United States today? Yeah, I I think um, just to connect with what Catherine was saying, that uh, you know, to <clears throat> to translate Arab poetry um, is to engage with deep differences and to make them friendly, peaceful, connected in a way that's really important. And is it's hard to reach an American audience. I can't remember um, if it was three per, less than three percent or less than one percent of um, American books are translated. Um, so it's a very small fraction of what it goes out there. So events like this are really important. Thank you. I um, gave you all four minutes to answer these questions. I know you're being very efficient, but if you want to. To circle back to anything, I welcome that. Um, Philip, you are also a translator and your latest book, Fugitive Refuge, weaves stories of your family's movement from Lebanon to eventually the US. And like many American born, you have Palestinian friends and family whom you're very worried about. And will you please touch on the Palestinian diaspora and what geodisplacement means to the idea of giving voice? Thanks, Karen. Um, oof. Well, um, one of the organizations that I volunteer for is called We Are Not Numbers, which is a uh, organization that um, uh, that offers in English language stories that Gazan writers are, are writing. In fact, Rifat al Alir was one of the co-founders who was killed uh, was, uh, by an Israeli strike. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, and I'm sure everyone here could talk about this, um, that when, you know, the bombings started, uh, we were all sort of trying to communicate with people. And, um, you know, uh, it's just, it's such a helpless feeling um, to be watching uh, a catastrophe unfold. Um, you know, somebody mentioned before we got on that the, this this is uh, in, in, you know the Nakba, the 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 catastrophe of 1947 and 48 for Palestinians um, has been the central uh, trauma around which uh, all of Palestinian history is kind of like circled. And and the, what's happening right now seems, in some sense, both a repeat of it and somehow worse because of the real time uh, witnessing of it. And so um, I. I'm not really sure what to say about it, except we're all caught in a kind of a traumatic space and we're all trying to manage that and all trying to communicate with those that we know in those other spaces, not only in Gaza, of course, but in the West Bank and in Jerusalem and, and, and of course, everywhere, Palestinian Americans and others in this country who are being uh, attacked or silenced or um, whatever. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what I have on my mind. I'm sure others could weigh in on this question as well. Thank you, that was very elegant. I would also love for you to tell us a bit about the Israeli-Palestinian Literature Project. Oh, just, just really briefly, I've been teaching a course since 2006. It's a kind of contrapuntal uh, course 
that enables students to sort of encounter uh, Palestinian literature and history and narratives, and and as well Israeli history literature and narratives. Um, and you know that course came out of um, my experience. Of course, my sister married a Palestinian in 2003, and I felt an obligation to uh, bring in an educational space uh, an encounter with these stories. Um, so the, it's on my website. You can see a little bit more about it. And I'm, you know, Adima actually came to my university and did a reading and um, participated and contributed in that. Um, you know, I suppose um, I, I sort of feel like understanding that you know both narratives um, empowers people in a way um, to become uh, more eloquent um, advocates and uh, truth tellers and, and peacemakers in the end. Um, this is a somewhat controversial decision and I understand that, but um, I feel, uh, I always love a space where I can, where there's difference and, um, and different views and perspectives because I think that our uh, ways of learning kind of can um, accelerate through uh, encounter with difference. Thank you. Um, Johannes and Joel of Action Books and Matvey Yankelevich of World Poetry Books, will you please briefly talk about the ways that your presses are giving voice and why this is of critical importance? Hi. Uh, I don't know if Joel and Johannes are going to make it here. Are they, are they coming? Otherwise, it's just me from World Poetry. <laughs> oh, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you all, first, first of all, for an amazing reading, or amazing readings, I should say. Um, I mean, as Sarah noted uh, earlier, a uh, very small percentage of books uh, it published in the US are translated. Uh, translated literature specifically. Um, it's about 3%. It's it's grown a little bit. The fiction market has grown, but the poetry market, not so much. Uh, so poetry is a very even, even smaller part of that 3%, as you can imagine. Um, uh, this is very different in other countries, uh, obviously, because English language books are very much exported, uh, but um, in any case, uh, the specific uh, the specifics of um, poetry and translation are that, of course, uh, most translated poetry books, uh, new poetry translations, are coming from languages that uh, mostly European languages, um, mostly you know the the main. Uh, European languages that have, uh, in a way, continue to have a kind of colonial power, right? Um, and from those languages, not many um, voices are translated. Uh, even, you know, Olivia writes in French, but not that many uh, French language poets uh, from more than, you know, from, from, uh, of, diverse backgrounds are are published in the US. So um but of course uh you know unfortunately there uh you know there is more and more Arabic poetry being translated or poetry of writers of uh uh Arabic descent but Arab descent but um or with uh, uh Arabic as a main language but I you know it's not as much as we'd like. Uh, and so I think part of the issue with cross-cultural understanding is the ability to read the literature of other cultures, right? Um, the availability and the presence in our on our bookshelves of names that are perhaps hard to pronounce for monolingual English speakers uh, from a variety of languages, right? So. Um, uh, for world poetry in particular, since our kind of mission and mandate is to publish poetry and translation uh, exclusively, um, we are trying as much as possible to expand the number of language, the 
re range of languages that we publish from. We'll be publishing a book from Hindi and from Indonesian uh, this uh, spring. Um, uh, and of course, it was very important to us, uh, not only for the range of language of, of sort of voices that we publish, but very important for us to publish Olivia's work. Uh, this was, of course, before uh, the beginning of this. Uh, well, there are no words for this war, but, um, you know, when we published Olivia's book, um, Chaos Crossing with uh, translations by Kareem and a foreword by Najwan Darwish um, in 2020, late 2022. Uh, this, you know, there were not very many Palestinian voices being published uh, uh, in the US uh, for a variety of reasons, right? Um, but, um, and it was also when I stumbled upon through Olivia, found out about Sarah and uh, Jeremy's work on her uh, her uh, body of work, Your Name Palestine, um, I, it seemed like uh, this was important work for us to bring out uh, to an English-speaking audience. And I'm so glad that Olivia has traveled to the U.S. to read from, from that, along with her translators and, and so forth. So... Um, you know, and in fact, it was interesting that the the one of the main reasons for Olivia's trip to the U.S. last September was the uh, was a, a festival of Palestinian writing uh, for for Palestinian writers, uh, Palestine writes uh, in uh, at at which kind of which which was co-hosted or hosted by uh, UPenn. Uh, and there was so much backlash uh, at UPenn. This was before October seventh. Uh, to this against this festival uh, that it sort of like preceded the kind of silencing that we've seen at universities. Um, it was sort of the 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 beginning, in a way, uh, of of a, of a string of uh, of or a, a movement, I'd say, like a uh, of uh, for silencing Palestinian voices uh, uh, in our. Uh, from administrations and donors to universities and so forth. So uh, it was a kind of scary moment and then it got scarier, you know, uh, um, uh, and more egregious, the kind of assault on on any kind of gathering to, to, to even read uh, poems uh, by Palestinian authors became a problem. I know people who uh, at UPenn were trying to just have a, a reading, like a, a group reading <laughs> uh, of students reading translations of Palestinian poets who just couldn't find, a, a, no department would give them a space on campus, you know. So, and this is just to read poems, you know. <laughs> so uh, that kind of thing, I, uh, that kind of uh, silencing, I think is incredibly um, dangerous and, uh, uh, and, Publishing is one of the forms in which one of the ways that I think <clears throat> we can do something about making available, making possible the some some kind of uh, wedge, driving some kind of wedge into this sort of um, culture of exclusion. Um, I would very highly recommend Olivia's book, uh, Chaos Crossing. Uh, but I would also recommend this book, which I happened to publish this fall, which had been in the works for a year, Ahmad Almala's book, uh, Border Wisdom, um, which has uh, actually poems he writes in English, but also quite a bit um, of kind of in in within that a sort of embedded uh, uh, text in Arabic that um, Kind of are interwoven into these narratives uh, around checkpoints mostly. Um, he's he is from uh, the West Bank, from Bethlehem, and he's uh, now in Philadelphia, or teaches at UPenn, um, uh, and has been in the states for a while, but um, was recently back there. Um, 
So um, yeah, this book, uh, which I published on a little press called Winter Editions that I started uh, last uh, last spring. Um, uh, also, you know, the work of Palestinian American poets is not. It, it was not easy for him to place this book. Uh, his previous publisher didn't want it. Uh, the publisher of his first book said no. Um, so diversity in the U.S. is also, sorry, there's a, some some Amazon package that someone needs probably. There was a ring at the door. <laughs> um, um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, it's interesting that even with the sort of Call for diversity in 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 publishing in the U.S. Uh, Palestinian American voices are not all often, um, or Arab American voices are not often um, centered. So, um, it's also something to think about related, of course, to translation. But now that Joyelle is here, perhaps uh, she can take over. Yeah. Thank you, Matvey. Hello, I apologize. Uh, we were having some technical difficulties and I'll just keep my remarks very short and I just say that, um, you know, I think the role of translation publishers, poetry publishers, poets, poetry readers, um, librarians, um, folks working, um, whether they're English language, Arabic, Francophone, uh, specialists or any anyone really is just to show that poetry exists poetry lives, poetry does not die. And there's a reason that poets, journalists, um, doctors have all become targets of um, this illegal military operation. They have similar roles to play, which is keeping something alive in the culture, in the bodies, in the people, in the language. And I think translation publishers, readers, um, people who like me just come with humility to hearing Palestinian poets and um, all of those uh, just work in the service of, of honoring that life and that it exists and that it moves through and across time um, in the form of poetry and that poetry's touch and breathe life to each other the way that Eloard seems to come through in I Say Your Name Palestine. There's like a a memory somewhere of like a, a anachronistic answering music in the French resistance, even despite um, the roles of different like language hegemonies um, in poetry, uh, something else pushes through. And um, I, I apologize if this is a bit abstract and poetic uh, compared to some of the more detailed uh, accounts folks have been giving, but I just strongly feel that this is the case that, um, and and the other part of it is what um, Matt Bay gestured towards at, towards the end, and what um, Philip's own work shows, which is that, you know, where is the border of Palestinian language? Where is the border of Arabic language? Where is the border of Arabic poetry? Where is the border of Palestinian poetry? It moves, um, not just because of accidents of histories, but because of the like eternalness and expansiveness of that work that moves all around the world and that moves from person to person, reader to reader. This is the reason it's important to build back libraries. This is the reason it's important to be um, listeners to poetry. And this is the reason it's important to come with humility to each other's voices and to center the voices that are keeping uh, Palestinian poetry and culture very much alive and through and against history. Thank you so much. Just, I would like to, um, bef just, um, slip in Carrie George of Elizabeth's Bookshop while we're just talking about booksellers for one more little minute um, to talk about the way your bookshop is curated. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for reading and letting me be a, a very small background part of all of this. Um, I'm from Elizabeth's Bookshop, which is a Black woman-owned bookstore in Akron. Um, and Black-owned bookstores have a history of selling and making available content that is radical, content, content that is by marginalized communities. Um, and we're really happy to continue that tradition. And we only feature books by authors who have been traditionally marginalized in the literary canon. Um, so all, all of your books, to the best of my extent that I could find them on bookshop.org um, are available via a, a bookshop.org link and anybody watching can purchase those books and support the authors and Elizabeth's bookshop as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. 
Um, Dima Gareth and Olivia, I will I um invite you to respond to Phil's question. Okay. I don't know if you saw in the chat, but I was just, uh, you know, um, you, we're thinking about you, um, obviously. I don't know if you're even able to write these days. Um, you know, um, you know, we, we could talk about translation, but I just want, you know, just to give space for you to just talk about, you know, your work at right, what's happening right now, either poetry or otherwise. Okay. Yes, okay, I can. Please go, go, go. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, very difficult, uh, very, uh, very difficult. Like it was, uh, I don't know. I think for four, for four weeks or more, I didn't uh, went out of the house, almost or no. And uh, I was speaking with an editor and had a lot. He didn't, uh, you know, he... He had the project to to edit a a poet from from Montpellier. He's on the board of Maison de la Poésie. I don't know if he, you met you met him. Uh, and he finally he came with a proposal to make a book with his poems and mine. And he's a French Jew. We are about the same uh, the same age. And his family was um, was in the concentration camps. And okay, we agree on political uh, ground because I, I would have accepted, but it was very, very difficult to write. Like, um, it's only like, uh, you know, to, to write on the war, on war, when the war is going on, it's almost impossible, in, almost impossible. Like, poetry don't like uh, war. No? Like it's just a word escape, and I was just uh, repeating the words that I, I I learned when I went to uh, to learn very late Arabic in uh, in in Syria. There was the Iraq War, and I was copying the word the, the word of the wars, and that was at the end of October. And slowly, slowly, when I started, finally, I I, I continue because I gave my word, and finally at the, the towards the end. Poetry came back. It was more, but I, I had to work a lot on it. It was a, a lot of repetition, a lot of description. I don't know the experience of the other people. Mm. I would like to Dima to say something, and then maybe I would mention something. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, for that. Um, you know, I I am a believe initially when the when the whole genocide began. Um, it was it was very difficult and it was extremely soul crushing and it still is soul crushing. But what comes through is because I'm a, a firm believer in the temporality of time. Right. And what's happening today is both an affirmation in a way of the knowledge that has been passed on to us by our elders and who experienced the Nakba. And yet it reaches past our elders and imparts a certain knowledge, not only from our elders, but from our ancestors who were indigenous and existed on Palestinian land and Palestinian earth for millennia prior to this moment. And so those voices, those voices come to me now and I stand on them. And so I insist on not, so I always insist on the beauty, dignity and longevity of our people. And the past, the past also offers glimpses for a liberatory future uh, where Palestinian freedom is tied with every freedom. So though our hearts break today, Gaza and Palestine's message to us is don't cower, keep fighting. And if that's done through our voices and through poetry, then we must insist upon that. So go ahead, Rayath. Yeah, I, uh, last week I sent to Catherine a new comments about on a poem she translated last year. I when, when I was in California in Los Angeles and at the Thomas Mann house when she translated several texts of me and I read them and we communicate like always we check the words and we discuss and everything was done the uh, the poem was perfect. I I want to submit it to a magazine and I read it and I felt that there's things change inside me after the 7th mm -hmm. of October. So the Thanks. meanings became different, even if they have, like, if sometimes I suggest, like, meanings 
and my my English is awful and Catherine she's a her mother tongue is English but like there is something shift inside me I began to see the things from different angle I'm a I am in a very very unfriend and very toxic place I am in Berlin and you know we have hundreds of cancellation there's not even one Palestinian person not cancelled in Germany I was lucky that I was maybe the first person who cancelled in Germany but uh, my cancellation was so obvious that it's racist because for example the day after me they cancelled the, the prize of Adania Shibli and became a big scandal but the cancellation of Adania you could discuss it you could discuss what is in her book what is not what is considered to be in German is a criticize, criticize of Israel not while mm -hmm. for me I was making the anthology for House for Poetry and this anthology have 35 Arabic poets have nothing political they were some political things they censorship them already so uh, there is nothing connected to Palestine nothing connected to anything she uh, she they cancelled the release of this anthology because of my ethnicity because uh, my personality as uh, as a, my identity as a Palestinian was mm -hmm. threatening for them so this is why, why I think the cancellation of my anthology was of one of the most dangerous cancellation in Germany because it targeted me without I mentioned anything. It was on the 12th of October. So the 5th of October, they say everything settled for the release. Everything is done. The 7th of October, two days after that, we know what happened. The 12th of October, they, they say we don't have any economy and they cancel it. So this kind of environment, and now, now we have 70... 78 79 cases where writers are, and artists are cancelled and they want to speak about it we have 150 where people are cancelled and they don't want to speak about it because if they speak about it the rest of germany they think they are they are anti-semitic and they will cancel them and we have hundreds of people who have been cancelled and they didn't know they are cancelled because they ask you every day, is it the right time for your exhibition? Is it the right time? Until you say no and then cancel. And we have hundreds of cancellation that is they didn't mention it. So uh, I think in some of the readings I was looking, they say it is the only time they were uh, in Europe. A cancellation more than now, it was in November 38 when the Crystal Night happened. And if this is true, it will be scary because from 1933 until November 38, Adolf Hitler was in the power for five years. If, if this is true, that this is the biggest cancellation in history of Europe, except the Christian night, then, then we are in a very bad situation because what happened in that time happened in dictatorship, so we can accept it. But to happening now in, the, in a democracy, it's, di it's like, it's, it, made, it put me in really existential cries of everything I believe in. I'm a very liberal when I uh, when it's about to art, but I'm very extreme left person in the rest of things. And I really believe in freedom of speech and exchange thoughts and like this. And now to see every Jewish, every Palestinian, every Jewish stand with Palestine, every Israeli stand with Palestine, every Palestinian, every person in Germany who tried to mention anything about what's going on have been canceled and silenced. And that is not the end. The most difficult things is all the things will happen in the future and will not be included in it. All the people I know, they have their email silent from the 7th of October. None of the people I know will be able to pay his bills and rent. We are in a really bad situation. And all this happened while the massacre happened in Gaza, the killing, the ethnic cleansing and the genocide. And we are not able even to... To, to be sad for the people and beloved and siblings and our beloved people who are got killed in this massacre. So in this environment, you will be very lucky if you are able to write or translate because that will be like a healing or, or a shelter for you. But to be honest with you, I'm really devastated and I can't do anything. I can't even, I'm not able to read books now. I'm reading only essays. Mm -hmm. Uh, in France, it's the same. Huh? People that I know, they say uh, uh, there was a chaos who was uh, who went out at the end of 2022. Then uh, your name, Palestine, who went out uh, in September. Oh, Olivia, we can't invite you now because you know it's sensitive. Yes, no invitation. 
it's not as bad that in uh, Germany because in Germany they think that they have they will uh, er, they will uh, wipe their culpability for the Nazi crimes in uh, erasing the Palestinian or being uh, insensitive to the suffering of the Palestinians. This is the way they 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 like for, for them to 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 um, to um, I will I say that combattre l'antisémitisme to um, I like to uh, combat combattre, combattre uh, the antisemitism means that you have to silence all the Palestinians be and to be uh, in, indifferent to their sufferings. You know, it's a very, very, you know, a perverse way of, uh, and in fact, is a is a contrary. The result is a contrary. Like they are encouraging anti-Semitism. It's so it's so unethical to do that. Unethical and so stupid. Uh, I don't know. It's, not, it's a poetry uh, reading, so we, but I don't want to go too much in, in um, politics. And we are. But there is a lot to say about it. There is a lot to say, and I thank you so much for bringing your voices to this conversation. I'm sorry that we are that we are out of time, but I'm so grateful to all of you, and um, I wish you well. We will share for those of you who are watching. We'll share your comments with our participants. Um, and let us all continue to work for peace and freedom for all peoples. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Awesome. Uh -huh. That was really.